Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason. I'm here to bring us the retrospective for Magni versus Chiesa, and we're going to look ahead to UFC 257, where Poirier is taking on McGregor for a second time, this time at 155 pounds. But let's talk about our spectacular performance going back uh, to Wednesday. We went uh, 10 and 4, 71% accurate overall. Uh, really killed it, I think, uh, from my perspective. We we haven't had a performance like this in quite a while, and I'll just let you in a little rumor last week even though we actually had a five and five performance uh, I only got one fight wrong with this metric that performed outstandingly well on this uh, card uh, and ended up only getting two wrong we missed uh, two debuters and two guys that weren't in the debut side uh, so the new metric is here to stay we tested it out last week uh, finally it's crossed the hundred fight threshold it's ready to go and I'm going to be deploying it again this coming week so let's get into it here's the show <laughs> All right, before we get into the main event here, I want to just throw one thing out there. We killed it uh, overall, I think, and we really killed it on the Patreon. We went 3 and O. Oh, we got all three correct on the Patreon. All underdogs, Kiesa, Akhmedov, and Chanel to round things out. If you picked those, you were definitely in the money. Three underdog picks, three wins. We haven't had a performance like that in quite a while. And uh, those were all on Patreon, so I really couldn't go wrong there if you're a subscriber. All right, let's talk about Magni versus Chiesa, though. Magni versus Chiesa. Wow. I mean, so this contest was phenomenal for Michael Chiesa, and it was a little bit disheartening if you're a fan of, of Neil Magni. You know, Chiesa went out there and made it his style of fight and made Magni uncomfortable everywhere. And I think, honestly, also got in the head of Magni a little bit. I was talking about this with my buddy, you know, during the fight, and it was like, why isn't Magni trying to maintain distance and, you know, strike against Chiesa because he clearly can't win these clinch battles that end up resulting in takedowns? And so, you know, I think part of it is that he was in his own head with a little bit of ego, and he was like, you know, I- I'm actually better than this. He thought maybe he could get the better of Chiesa in the moment. Now, when you're in the moment, you know, you're not thinking clearly, and I believe that he got caught up in his ego, caught up in the fact that he didn't believe Chiesa was that much better than him and ended up playing into his hand and playing Chiesa's game. Chiesa wants that to be a dirty fight. He wants it to go to the ground. He wants to be able to get into that flow state on the ground where he has an, where he's a little more efficient with his energy, right? And Magni was never in the contest really able to make it his fight, okay? Um, he stung him, I think, once in the second round, maybe won that round. I think he did on at least one of the judges' scorecards. And he ended up, um, you know, losing the fight overall. Um, but I think, you know, he just needs to take a step back and take a look at the big picture and really stick to the game plan, listen to his corner men going forward. Uh, but what's next for Michael Chiesa? Well, he called out Colby Covington. I love that fight. I think it's an awesome one. Um, I don't know if Chiesa has the talent to hang with Covington. Hey, Covington, all that you like, but the guy has a work ethic that is unrivaled and uh, he is really, really talented. So uh, just because we don't like him necessarily, doesn't mean he can't win and can't perform really well. I mean, look at him in the Usman fight. I know he lost that fight, but he was really competitive against Usman. Probably the most competitive fight that Usman's ever had, uh, you know, barring us looking into the future against Burns. I think that's actually going to be a good one coming up in February. Uh, But either way, though, Chiesa picks up a solid win. I hope to see him fight the likes of Covington, climbing the ladder, and making his way to the top. So uh, hats off to Chiesa. We picked up a solid win and a Patreon underdog pick as well. All right, in the next one here, we had Worley Alves defeat Moon year lays and in this one here i think a lot of people were sleeping on the veteran i think a lot of people were sleeping on alves um he's kind of a journeyman uh but uh, you know he was going up against a guy that's supposed to be a real hot ticket in munir and uh, he crumbled under the pressure uh, or at least he you know just wasn't able to perform like he had intended alves was hitting him with these devastating uh, body shots uh, via kick and uh, he ended up just catching lays uh sort of towards the back of the head uh, but honestly clipping him getting him down to the ground and picking up a win. Uh, two minutes and 35 seconds in, uh, Munir only lands two strikes and uh, is also taken down as 17 strikes against him in addition to the knockdown. So uh, Alves goes out there and puts in a veteran performance against a hot talent, or at least one that was supposed to be. 
And the next one we actually got incorrect. Ike Villanueva defeats Vinceus Morea. Um, Morea looked a, a little hesitant out there. You know, I, I didn't really think he was the aggressor. He wasn't being first. He was maybe trying to counter Villanueva. Uh, maybe try to, you know, see where his gas tank was. Uh, but I didn't like this performance out of him. I thought that he was going to perform a bit better. It seemed like Ike had the aggression, the killer instinct here. And uh, he definitely deserved the win. Uh, however, keep in mind that Morea did also land 24 strikes himself. They ended up equal in that outing. It's just the knockdown down happened and then of course we end up with the knockout 39 seconds in round number two in the next one the last one we got right for the non-debuters i'm oh, sorry last one we got wrong for the non-debuters Viviane Arujo defeats Roxanne Modafferi. I was saying, you know, a lot of people are sleeping on Modafferi, and uh, she did make some good attempts throughout the fight. She was never out of it, uh, I would say. Granted, um, she was getting taken down. She was being outstruck, but you could see she had heart. She was stinging Arujo when she could. Uh, she ends up still ends up picking up a loss here, though. I didn't think Arujo was going to perform quite as well as she did, uh, but uh, she was just looking a lot faster, a lot stronger uh, than Modafferi, and her experience, you know, was deep. It is deep. She definitely lean on it and you could see that she could pick her moments to try to capitalize uh, but was ultimately not able to get the upper hand uh, then in the next one we got correct as well another patreon pick matt schnell defeats tyson nam outstriking him 85 to 58 but nam did get some damage and had a few moments against schnell i don't think this was a split decision in my opinion i think schnell was landing the combinations and really picking up the volume here uh, where honestly i don't know how somebody gave it to tyson nam but he did hit him with some good shots he you know said that he's basically just a right hand and that landed a few times hurting Schnell but not ultimately taking him out of the contest and so we ended up picking up a win there and another one we got right uh, Lerone Murphy defeats Douglas uh, Silva de Andrade uh, this is another unanimous decision Lerone Murphy just being more active here um, you know showing that he can fight on the ground a little bit, picking up a takedown, getting out of a, a bad position against Douglas' takedown and just showing he's a pretty well you know rounded mixed martial artist um he did say that he did not perform very well in that outing, but he's hoping to come back and perform even better. And against a guy that, even though I think his record was a little padded, uh, Douglas still, you know, was what, 26-3, and three, I think, going into this contest and just had a phenomenal record, showed that he was a veteran of the game and uh, even performed a little better than I thought. Um, so either it was Silva was a little better than I thought or Murphy just didn't step up to the task entirely. Either way, though, we get away with a win and Murphy picks up a solid one. And the next one, I don't know how people were sort of sleeping on Akhmedov. When I saw that he was underdog money, it didn't make sense. Uh, Akhmedov defeats Tom Brees. This is a really one-sided affair. Akhmedov, uh, you know, doesn't have his slow start like he usually has where it's methodical, you know, scoring takedowns, sort of getting into a rhythm and pace. He came hot out of the gate right away, took it to Breeze, scored a takedown immediately, and he was just on Breeze for the entirety of round number one, went right back to that same toolkit for round number two, took him down, put him in the arm triangle, and that was all she wrote, one minute, 41 seconds into round number two. Akhmedov picked up great money for us and a solid win overall. All right, moving on to the next one. We got incorrect. This was the debut fight. We slept on Ricky Simone a little bit, but he looked like the Ricky Simone of old, the guy that I thought was going to go out there and defeat guys like Uriah Faber and ended up losing to them. Uh, the guy that was going to defeat Rob Vaughn, he looked a lot better. You know, he, he had a split decision against Ray Borg that was close, but he showed that he could still go out and squash talent when people think that maybe he's on the slide. And so that's the Ricky Simone I like to see. Uh, granted, because of his slide, we did pick against him. The numbers didn't support it, uh, but it was a debut bout, so, you know, not everything could be taken into consideration uh, like we normally would and uh, he picks up a really good win arm triangle at the end of round number two four minutes in all right the next couple here we had suma jerry defeat zakara adashov outstrikes him two to one picks up the unanimous decision victory for us uh Dalcha limagula defeats marcus perez uh, this was another unanimous decision outstriking him 29 to 25 just doing a little more work i thought perez was still competitive in this one i wasn't super confident about the unanimous decision uh, but did enough to pick up the win uh, Francisco Figueredo defeats Jerome Rivera. Uh, this is another one we got correct. Uh, Francisco, Francisco had to lean a lot in his takedowns, even though he was slightly outstruck, and he picked up a solid unanimous uh, decision. In the last three here, Mike Davis versus Mason Jones. We did get this one incorrect. I thought Mason Jones did enough to pick up the um, the decision in this one. However, they did get fight of the night money. These guys went to war. I thought Mason Jones outdid him. Outstruck him 117 to 108 and picked up the one takedown, but Mike Davis's three were enough to pull things through, and so the Walshman Mike Davis did have to take a loss on this one, uh, but I did think, honestly, we got that one right. Uh, last two here, Umar Namagamadov defeats Sergei Morov. Uh, Morov looked pretty tough. Uh, Umar looked really good, a 
I'd say a more well-rounded uh, dynamic striker than his uh, older cousin Khabib, uh, but still with a lot of takedown prowess. Uh, he scored five takedowns over their uh, two-round scrap and ended up picking up a rear naked choke to close things out towards the middle of the second round. And then the last one we got correct, Manon Fiorot defeats Victoria Leonardo. Uh, outstrikes, are like, outstrikes are like mad, 53-17, to 17, also picking up a takedown to cement the rounds, and then uh, finally picking up the TKO late in round number two. Uh, so just a good card overall, very long card, 14 fights overall. Uh, so we went 10 and four. We did really well. We missed two debuts, two non-debuts, and I'm hoping to take that performance and carry it forward to UFC 257. Let's get into it. Here are the fight picks. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about UFC 257, starting with the main event. And so in this one here, we have Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor meeting for a second time in their careers, this time at 155 pounds. And in this one, I'm going to lay it on the line for you. I think Conor gets it done. Now, the numbers support that, but in the back of my mind, I think a lot of people, the media's coverage surrounding this, fans on Twitter, Reddit, whatever you want to say, I think a lot of people are sleeping on Poirier. Now, they might be sleeping on him for good reason, because here I am being a little bit of a hypocrite coming and telling you I think Connor's going to win but but Poirier is such a competitor such an amazing boxer um, has good submission game you know he could upset us he could surprise us this is a fight that may not be as simple or as easy as most people think it's going to be you know Connor's walking around saying 60 second knockout I mean hey is it possible after the cowboy fight and what he did to Poirier the first time no it's not out of their own possibility I just think everybody needs to have a little little bit uh, more tempered expectation of what could happen here. Um, will it go to the decision? I'm going to guess probably not. I think there will be some kind of finish in this one. But the idea of Connor cruising to victory, you know, the way he thought he was going to cruise right through Nate Diaz um, is not the case. Now, Connor has matured more since then. I don't think he's approaching the fight in the same capacity, but I know fans might be approaching that fight in the same capacity. So don't expect it. Be happy if it happens, you know, if you're a Connor fan and everything, but don't expect that he's going to walk right through through a guy that was a former champion that went on and fought Khabib and, you know, hung with him for, you know, a little bit of the time. Uh, you can't really say too much uh, positive about Poirier in that Khabib fight. I'm sure he'd love to run that one back for sure, uh, except for maybe that, uh, that guillotine he just missed. Anyways, uh, just from like a pure fighting perspective, though, you know, I think honestly, Connor does possess the better skill set here. I think people sleep a little bit on Connor's ability to grapple, his ability to stuff takedowns. Um, he also still has the reach advantage on Poirier uh, as well. So I think he's gonna be able to stay rangy when he wants to. If Poirier does decide to put a little bit of panic wrestle or wrestling into him to grind him into the cage, he's going to quickly find out that Connor, you know, is a pretty competent grappler. He was able to, you know, s prevent some of Khabib's takedowns. Not all, obviously. There was some smashing affairs there, but he was able to hang with Khabib in certain moments, okay? So I don't know if that's going to be Poirier's pathway to victory. It means it's probably going to have to lean on his boxing, and, you know, he could sting him. We saw Diaz sting McGregor once. We know when McGregor's cardio isn't there, he definitely becomes vulnerable, and that's what Dustin's going to have to lean on. I don't think Dustin's going to walk out there looking for a flush knockout, especially when you, you know, look at the fact that, uh, you know, he wasn't able to ma knock out Max Holloway, and he had to give a lot of damage to... Uh, Dan Hooker in order to defeat him, so he's definitely a volume type guy. Connor does struggle if it gets into a volume like situation, uh, but he could spark him at any moment. It is possible. Um, I think Connor, though, he's going to be able to get it done early. The guy looks good, and you know, it is Southpaw versus Southpaw, so there won't be as much awkward. Well, I guess actually two Southpaws would be a little bit awkward since it's less common that those two would uh, appear next to each other. Uh, but I think that Connor has all the tools to get it done. I expect that he will get it done. Uh, but do not be surprised if he catch some kind of upset here because that's how good Dustin Poirier is. It's like take it with a grain of salt situation. You know, no matter how good one guy is, you cannot overlook the other, especially when their skill set is this high. And, you know, this was the reason I came down a while back when I say Gaethje was going to beat Khabib. I thought that Gaethje's skill set was too high. I thought that he would outperform expectations, even though, you know, I only gave him like a 4 or 7% chance of winning. Um, I think that, honestly, you still got to, uh, give a nod to these guys that can perform and can step up to the occasion. At the end of the day, though, I'm still picking Connor. I know I gave a lot of excuses for why I think he should support Poirier, but I'm still sticking with Connor. He's going to be the pick on Saturday.
All right, this next one here is actually a debut fight. <laughs> Tan Heyman Hooker is taking an Iron Mike Chandler. So Iron Mike Chandler is really making his UFC debut. Uh, if you go and look for the numbers for him, he has some strike force numbers that date back about 12 years ago at this point. Now, more like 11 years ago. So his stats are not anything I can go off of. They're, they're statistically too old. So I'm treating it like a debut. And honestly... I, Okay, you know what? It's not as clear cut, but I think Dan Hooker is going to be able to win here. You know, we, we know what Michael Chandler did in Bellator. You know, his wrestling is phenomenal, but he's had a little bit of a questionable chin. Knocked out when he lost the title. Okay, and we don't really know how he's going to perform once he's in this USADA testing pool. Was what he's doing in Bellator going to carry over perfectly? I don't know. None of us know. He's an unproven product under this set of rules. And so if you're Michael Chandler in Bellator getting, you know, basic drug testing and you can rehydrate via IVs, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that's still allowed or not over there. Uh, but if these different things are a factor or you have to change your nutrition cycle or your entire supplement game has to change. I can see those becoming factors in this. Now, that being said, though, I still think Dan Hooker is the kind of guy that possesses a skill set to defeat a guy like Chandler. Look what he went out and did against Ally Quinta, a guy with competent wrestling, with competent ground skills. Now, is he Michael Chandler and Ally Quinta? No, probably not, but I think he can do it. He also probably, he really came close to closing the door on Poirier. So really, Hooker is just one step away from fighting the best in the world at 155 pounds, one of the most you know, competitive, rich environments in all of mixed martial arts in the UFC. And I think that Hooker possesses the skill set to go to the next level. Now, what does that mean for Michael Chandler? Eh, it probably means a little bit of a Ben askren esque situation where you know, he comes out, looks okay for a little while, and then just kind of putters to a halt and maybe retires. You know, the guy is 34 years of age. He's getting a little up there uh, considering how competitive the division is. But we'll see how things play out. Again, I'm treating it like a debut, so I'm not using the stats here. And if I did, I'll be honest, Chandler does win that one, but I can't use them. They're not as reflective, I think, of what Chandler's doing today. So I'm nixing them and we're sticking with the debut numbers, which put Dan Hooker as your winner in the comment. All right, moving on to the next one here. We have Jessica Evil Eye taking on JoJo Joanne Calderwood. And in this one here, I got Jessica Eye. I love JoJo Calderwood. I think she's fun as hell to watch. I think she's got great skills. She's even integrated some grappling. But Jessica Eye is just somebody who's been here the entire time fighting amazing woman after amazing woman, going out, beating Caitlin Shikagian, going, fighting Shevchenko, losing, obviously, bouncing back, beating against Arroyo, losing to Calvillo. You know, I think she's still there. You know, we've seen this kind of win-loss thing out of JoJo too, so I don't think it's anything we can kind of hang against Clark um, or even JoJo for that matter. But I think the skill set here is really going to come down to Jessica I just being the better, more well-rounded mixed martial artist uh, with better experience in my opinion. I think she's fought some better opponents, having climbed the ladder, getting up to Shevchenko, and, you know, experiencing that, I think, is going to take her a long way. She also was able to beat Chikagian, something Calderwood was not able to do, and so she was able, you know, to deal well uh, with that That's really rich striking style. Um, and I know that uh, Jessica I, if it does go to the ground, isn't really a slouch on the ground, even though she doesn't go for her own takedowns. She's good at preventing them. She has good takedown defense. She also has a little bit of submission game to lean on if she can't get back up. So I think overall, we will be looking at Jessica I victory here. However, JoJo is really good. I could definitely see some kind of upset, but I'm sticking with Jessica Evil Eye. All right, next one here, we have Matt, the steamroller for Vola. I love his fight name, taking on Ottoman Azatar. So Azatar just looks like a wrecking machine coming into this. Two wins in the UFC, amazing striking output, amazing uh, finishes via knockout. However, We've seen Frivola just looking really good right now. Wins over Turner, wins over Pena in his last outing. And he has the takedowns, I think, to nullify a guy like Ottoman. When a guy leans on his striking and his power that much, the best thing you can do is take it away from him and choke him out on the ground. And that is what the steamroller Frivola does so well. He's going to be able, I think, to get takedowns. He's going to be able to stuff Ottoman's power take it away from him, put him in a place where he's not comfortable and he's not the killer of worlds. He's going to find it very difficult to knock him out when he's on his back. So we are going with Matt the Steamroller for Vola to pick up a win in this contest. 
All right, next one here, we have a rising star in Amanda Hebus taking on Mariana Rodriguez. So I think a, really a statement piece for Hebus was when she beat Van Zant. That really put her, you know, on the radar. Not because Van Zant's a great mixed martial artist, but because she's hot. And I think most people watch the fight for that reason. Now, Amanda Hebus is cute herself, but this really isn't about any of that. This is about star power of Hebus, and I think she has it. And I think she's going to be able to go out and defeat Mariana Rodriguez. We've seen Hebus have great striking. Her grappling is amazing. She has win over Mackenzie Dern of all people, and we know that we've seen Mariana struggle recently with a loss to Esparza and a draw to Calvillo. She hasn't won since Tisha Torres three contests ago, and I think she's going to struggle when she gets into the, you know, larger reaching Mandahibis, uh, and she's going to have difficulty, I think, on the ground. She's going to have difficulty difficulty keeping up with the volume of strikes and her striking acumen is high. I think the defense of Hebus is going to be able to frustrate Rodriguez. Rodriguez make her start reaching and then the, those takedowns are going to be there when she's off balance and Hebus is going to be able to take it to her world and put it on the ground. With that being said, Amanda Hebus is our pick on Saturday. All right, the next one here, we have Armin Saryukin taking on Nasret HarpaQuest. So this is a great fight here. This is probably a bit of an underdog. So we have an amazing, you know, Russian wrestling style fighter taking on a Farasa Hobby TriStar product in Nasret HarpaQuest. And in this one here, though, I'm going to go with Saryukin. Ever since he came out and he lost to Makachev, he's looked great. Wins over Hamos in his last outing, win over Abon Mercier in the, in the outing before that, and the Hamos... Uh, uh, Hamos, pretty common name. It was Davi Hamos who we defeated, uh, who's just an amazing BJJ style fighter. So I think that he has a very well rounded skill set that's going to be able to deal with HarperQuest. Granted, HarperQuest's striking output is much higher than Saryukin, but the takedown game is a lot higher. Uh, comparatively for Saryukin, and I think he's going to be able to put it there. As long as HarperQuest is not able to stuff a lot of takedowns, he's going to be in for a very long night, and I think Saryukin's ground game is going to take over. This is a guy that did hang with Islam Makachev, who is a very high-level grappler. He defeated Aubin Mercier in similar fashion. I think that he has the skills to beta bills. He's going to get it done on the ground on Saturday. All right, the next one here is going to be taking place at middleweight. We have Brad Tavares taking on Shoeface, Antonio Carlos Jr. I love his fight name. But I do think he's going to lose. So both these fighters are struggling recently. Uh, we have uh, Brad Tavares taking some rough losses, but two really good fighters in the game, Shabazian and Adesanya. When we look over at Antonio Jr., we're seeing losses to Heinich and Hall. And so honestly... The MMA math for me sides with Tavares because he's been there. He's been under the big lights. He's fought the best in the biz, and the numbers support it. The only thing I could say for Shoeface, though, if he scores takedowns here and starts to make it a grappling contest, it is going to be a long night for Tavares, who has a 5-inch reach disadvantage. So it will be difficult for him to keep this a stand-up, rangy, striking affair, but we'll see how things play out. Maybe he'll be able to stay inside and stay away from the shots. I'm hoping that's the case, but we are going with Tavares in this one. All right, the next one here is going to be bantamweight. We have Juliana Pena, the Venezuelan vixen. It's an interesting fight name. Taking on veteran Sarah McMahon. And in this one here, I like Pena. Um, now, granted, we did see a loss from Pena against Durandamy, but Durandamy is a really, really high-level fighter, and we haven't seen that same high level out of Sarah McMahon in a long time. Uh, she is 40 years old at this point. She's a little over the hill. Um, granted, her takedown game and grappling could still be there. She was a very good and still is a good grappling artist. However, I do not think that age is on her side. It's hard for me to come out here and tell you a 40-year-old fighter is going to perform at the highest level in this professional sport against somebody who is in their prime currently at just about 32 years of age. Uh, so we'll see how things play out here. Sorry, 31 years of age. Uh, we'll see how things play out here, but I am going to stick with Juliana Pena to pick up a win in this one. She is the pick on Saturday. All right, next one here, we're going to have a fun one. Khalil Roundtree is taking Marcin Pacino. So uh, Roundtree was supposed to retire in his last outing when he lost to Kudaleba, uh, but I guess he wanted one more, and he's getting against a guy who's probably going to be cut. So uh, Marcin Pacino uh, has had three straight losses in the UFC, Alvi, Ankalev, and Rodriguez. Uh, Roundtree has proven to be a really good fighter um, when he really wants to be, I guess. Uh, wins over Sakai were, were huge. Eric Anders uh, losing to Kudaleba. I mean, he maybe can't hang with the 
highest level guys, but trains down at Tiger Muay Thai, or at least he has in the past, um, has had a good fight camp around him, has really improved a lot, I think, since the early days, and I think he's capable of beating Pacino, even though he has a little more experience. Uh, I think the southpaw and round three and the reach advantage are going to be on his side in this one, and uh, let's not overlook the fact that Pacino has been struggling over and over and over again under the bright lights. So I got to go with the guy that's at least won in the UFC before, Khalil Roundtree. All right, this next one here, we have a guy I'm not too familiar with, and Makud Murdoff taking on Andrew Sanchez. And in this one here, I believe that we're going to have Murdoff pick up a win here. I don't know too much about Murdoff, but he just has looked really good in his highlight reels. He has great striking output, um, has a little bit of ground game, and despite not picking up a lot of takedowns, I think that he has the potential there. He picked up a really good one against Trevor Smith. I think he's going to be carrying forward with that style of fighting, and I think he's going to be able to defeat a guy in Sanchez that does have more experience in the UFC, uh, but has struggled on and off. This guy has been able to tie two wins together since 2018 to 2019, and I don't think he's going to be able to do it uh, tying another win over Wellington Terman, where he picked up uh, just a quick knockout in the first round. I think it's going to be hard to put Murdoff out like that. I see this thing going deep, and I see Murdoff coming away with a decision win. All right, so next one here, we have a real veteran in Nick Lentz, uh, 36 years of age, 30, 11, and 2. Guy's done it basically at all, but he's taking on a 13-0 Russian product, and uh, this this guy, Mosfar Ivalov, I think is pretty much a lock of the night. Now, Nick Lentz has surprised us before. Um, he wins over Skoltman, uh, sorry, Holtzman, uh, Gray Maynard. And that one's a little not too recent. Gray Maynard's been out of the game for a while. Uh, and he has lost recently to Charles Oliver and Arnold Allen. But he has fought really high-level talent. I think he's going to struggle here against a guy who's a really hot prospect, though. Ivalov is undefeated. Uh, has a few fights in the UFC against Mike Grundy, Barzola, and Seng Wing Choi. Uh, he's not fought easy guys. He's picked up a lot of take downs in these affairs and he's come away looking good. The only one where he was really outdone was against Mike Grundy uh, losing six takedowns to him but still winning the fight overall and just kind of smashing his way to victory. Uh, so we'll see how things play out here but I do not see Nicolens picking up a win here. I think honestly this is lock of the night with Evil Off getting a win. And then in the last one here, we have Amir Albazi taking on Zalgas Zumagov. And in this one, I'm taking Albazi. Uh, both these guys just have one fight in the UFC, so we don't have a whole lot to go off of. Uh, we saw a good takedown rate of Amir. And I think he'll be able to carry forward with it. We're going to stick with Albazi in this one. So let's talk about it one more time. We got McGregor, Hooker, I, Frivola, Hebus, Saryukin, Tavares, Pena, Roundtree, Muradov, Ivalov, and Albazi to round things out. So I'm hoping to carry forward with the success. Uh, hopefully I haven't shot myself in the foot by saying we did well last week, unknowingly. Uh, did really well this past week. And uh, let's make it three in a row. I'm really looking forward to it. And if you would like to talk to me about it, please reach over at fightingspiritpodcast at gmail.com. You also can get in touch with me at MMAFightPick01 on Twitter. And you also can join the Patreon where we went 3-0 and oh this last week. And I'm hoping to carry that again and make you some money, make myself some money. Let's get it done. With that being said, though, until I speak with you again next time, happy fight picking.